Hi, welcome to Cross Community Church. We want to invite you to worship with us Sundays at 8 a.m. in Palm Beach Shores and at 10 a.m. in Palm Beach Gardens. You can find out more about our church and our ministries at crosscommunity.cc. Sing with us.
let's praise the Lord. He is holy. He is worthy. He is mighty. Jesus, we thank you that you are our king and that you are always fighting for us. We thank you that we are your people, that you have called us by name, that you have adopted us into your family, and we know that you will protect us and you will lead us no matter what happens. Amen. Praise the Lord one more time. Come on, let's just praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Well, now is the time that all the introverts love to step out of your seats and greet everybody. Shake some hands, give some hugs. As you're taking your seats, which most of you are, I'd like to also welcome our online viewers. Um, my name is Kimmy Barnett, and I do have the privilege of serving on staff here. I'm the director of our communications. And if you are new with us this morning, maybe this is your first time to church in a long time. Maybe you have, um, you're have you looking for a new church and you're here with us this morning. Whatever your reason is, you could have been anywhere, you're here. We're so glad. Church, can we please welcome all of our guests? You know, we were all at new at some point, so we just want you to feel just welcomed and loved. So if you are new, we would love to get to know you a little bit. Um, we, we have a lot of events happening here across community, so we'd like to get you plugged into our weekly e-news. Maybe there's an area in your life that we can pray for as a leadership team, so we just want to encourage you to take a moment and fill out our in-touch card. You'll find it right in front of you. Hold on to it, and then as you exit today, you can drop that off at our welcome desk. You'll be greeted by a smiling face, and we have a special gift for you to take home. Happening next Sunday, which is August 13th, we're going to have our back to school prayer. We know some of you are starting school this week, but next week we're going to have our church prayer. So all the students, the kids, the teachers, the facility, we're going to ask you to come up here on stage and then Pastor Randy will lead the church as we pray over you as you enter into the new school year. So you want to make sure that you're here next Sunday. Also happening next Sunday we are, is Step Up Sunday. So if you are a student or a kid and you're moving into the next classroom, whether that be the preschool classroom where you're going from fifth grade into sixth grade, so middle school classroom, next Sunday you are actually going to start. So if you have any questions about what that looks like or where your classroom is, I just want to encourage you to reach out to Melanie Schmidt. She is our Youth and Families Ministry Director. If you're not familiar with Awana, it is a global ministry, but it's executor. It happens at the local level. And what this ministry is, is for kids ages three through fifth grade, and they meet on Wednesday nights, and they memorize the scripture. They have a time for games, and they have a group story. And so the cost for Awana, annual cost, is $50 per child. Not everybody can afford this cost. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to have an Awana sponsorship. So if you would like to donate to help a child, to help send a child to Awana, you can do so when you give online using Venmo or using our giving envelope this morning. Just indicate that your gift is for Awana. Also, speaking of Awana, registration is happening um, this week because Awana starts on Wednesday, August 16th. So it's a week from this Wednesday. So you have to fill out your regis registration forms by next Sunday. Even if you attended last year, you still have to register this year. The forms are available at the Outreach Center. You can pick one up after service, or again, you can contact Melanie. And finally, last Wednesday, we had our annual Back to School Family Fun Night, and we had a tremendous turnout. We hope you had fun. It was a great time, and we had a um, youth hot dog fundraiser. The cost for the food was covered, so every cent that they raised goes to our Merge Youth, and they did they exceeded their goal. So on behalf of the youth and the leadership team, we just want to say thank you for your generosity for supporting our youth. All of the funds that they collect are going to go towards upcoming um, activities throughout the next school year, so we just thank you for that. So let's continue in our worship with scripture reading and prayer. Good morning, church family. Glory to God. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Please stand with me this morning. Our monthly Bible verse comes from Psalms 100, verse 4 and 5. Please say it with me. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Lord. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace this morning. Lord, we praise you and glorify you in everything that we do. And Lord, I ask in the coming 
days and weeks, Lord, we just continue to rely strongly on you for everything that we do. I ask, Father God, that the Holy Spirit move in this place this morning, Father, as we continue in worship. And Lord, we continue with the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. for those among us who are lost, who are looking for answers. We pray that you bless them and keep them and draw them to yourself. God, we pray for our family members, for our brothers and sisters in Christ across the oceans who are being persecuted. We pray for your church to grow, to multiply, to expand in the proclamation of the gospel all over this world as we proclaim it from generation to generation. Sing, may his favor be upon you. May his favor be upon you. And a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children. May his favor be upon you. And a thousand generations your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside 
him for his blessings this morning. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity Cause there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more and standing face to face with fear died and rose again holy holy is the Lord and every songs of faith we sing through doubt and fear in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears and there will be a day Everything we do today should be pointed to the person and the glory of Jesus Christ. When you leave the service today, everything you do should be oriented around bringing Jesus Christ glory and honor and praise. And we've been put on this earth. We occupy this geographical location. We breathe the breath that is on loan to us from God for the express purpose of bringing glory and honor and praise to Jesus Christ. 
We bring a lot of things to church with us when we attend on any given Sunday. We all bring our brokenness. Some of us bring bitterness. Others bring a spouse with a bad attitude. Can I get a witness this morning? We all bring something to church when we attend the house of the Lord. But one thing that we are commanded in Scripture to bring is a psalm of thanksgiving. There are many psalms in the Bible. If you turn to the book of Psalms, you will discover that there are over 150 chapters. There are psalms of lament where the author is complaining to God about the evil and the suffering in the world. And could I just push pause and say this? If you're going to complain, don't complain to people. Complain to God. He understands your heart anyway. He knows the words that are on the tip of your tongue. And he knows the words before you even speak them. So complain to God. He can take it. And he can reorient your perspective and give you reasons not to complain but to comment complement the mercy of God. There are other psalms that talk about God's righteousness and his grace and his power. Some psalms are known as messianic psalms that lift up the prophetic significance of the coming Messiah. Other psalms talk about God's grace and his mercy in helping Israel overcome enemies. And today I'm going to talk to you about Psalm 100. Psalm 100 is one of those psalms that repeatedly reminds us that we are to bring a psalm of thanksgiving to the Lord. In fact, today is probably the easiest title of any message that I've ever preached because the psalm is already given a title in the Bible. It's called a psalm of thanksgiving. Now this morning, Brian and the team has led us in an ensemble of songs that points us to the glory and the grace and the mercy and the kindness and the power and the majesty and the might and the sovereignty and the goodness and the grace. I could keep on listing adjectives, but we've already lifted up the name of Jesus and we've been reminded that the reason that we live is for his glory and his honor and his praise. And this psalm reiterates this deep theological understanding that the express reason why we've been put on this earth is to bring glory and honor to God. You're a businessman. Bring glory and honor to God as a businessman. You're a dentist. Well, do fillings and extractions and root canals for God's glory and honor and praise. You're a school teacher. Then teach those snotty-nosed kids how to praise God for the glory of his name. You're a retired person will use this season of your life to expand the gospel and to bring glory and honor to Jesus in every area of your life. And for God's sake and for his glory, make sure you're worshiping him throughout the week. And when you come to God's house on Sunday, you come and you celebrate the goodness of God and you offer him a psalm of thanksgiving. This psalm reminds us this morning of how we are to worship God and why we are to worship Him. If I were to tell you what do I want to accomplish this morning as we unpack these five verses in Psalm 100, it would be simply this. I want us to know how the Bible tells us to worship, and I want us to understand why we worship. This morning, this passage of Scripture answers both of those questions. First of all, how are we to worship? Now, some of us may have a very misinformed and skewed understanding of what it means to worship God. We may never have really read the Bible and thought deeply about what it means to worship God. Whoever the psalmist was... Some Old Testament scholars tell us it was David. Most likely that is who wrote this psalm. After all, he is the primary author of most of the psalms throughout the Bible. But Moses wrote a few psalms too. And if you know anything about Moses, you know that Moses stood on the backside of a desert for more than 40 years. And he experienced the silence of God while God was shaping him and forming him to be a great leader. And that did not become a reality for Moses until he was 80 years of age. So most of you this morning are in good company. Can I get a witness this morning? Most of us haven't gotten to 80 yet. Some of us have. In fact, let me just push pause and say at the end of the service, 
I'm going to have some of you strong young men help escort Miss Jeannie up to this stage because today we're going to celebrate her 96th birthday. And she has every reason in the world to be extremely grateful. But you and I have a reason to be thankful. We have a reason to worship God. We have all the reason in the world to sing praises to Him. I want you to think about where you were when the Holy Spirit showed you two things. First of all, He showed you that you were a sinner. And then He showed you how to be saved. Trust me, none of us in this room are smart enough to figure that out. We're not good enough to figure it out. God intervened out of His grace and mercy. And this morning, we are reminded of how we ought to worship. Not only how, but why. And the psalmist says this, beginning in verse 1 of Psalm chapter 100. Make a joyful noise before the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. You know, God was merciful to Moses and God is merciful to you. God was steadfast in his love toward Abraham and he's steadfast in his love toward you and me. He was faithful to David and to the people of Israel. He was faithful to David. He was faithful to the disciples, to the apostles, and he's faithful to you. What he did in Billy Graham's life, he'll do in your life. What he's done in the church in the past, he'll do it in the present because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the outworking of the day of Pentecost. Today, we have every reason in the world to listen to what this text has to say so that we can leave here knowing how to worship and why we worship. The devil does not want you to worship. The devil does not want you to sing praises to Jesus. The devil doesn't want you to be filled with the depth and the riches and the grace of God's mercy. He doesn't want you to understand the depth of his word. Satan doesn't want you to know that you've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to know that Jesus was crucified on a cross, on a hill, outside of Palestine. He doesn't want you to know that in that death, he satisfied the wrath of God because you and I can never satisfy it. Satan doesn't want you to know that Jesus was raised from the dead and was vindicated by the Holy Spirit and declared to be the Son of God. He doesn't want you to know that he ascended into heaven and that he's at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for you. Satan doesn't want you to know that you are the apple of God's eye. He doesn't want you to know that you can be eternally secure. He doesn't want you to know that Jesus died for the sins of the world. He doesn't want you to know that the Holy Spirit sealed you until the day of redemption. He doesn't want you to know that Jesus is coming back one day to rapture his church. He wants you to think that this is all there is. He wants you to become bitter. He wants you to think that you're stuck in your brokenness. He wants you to think that there's no mercy and there's no grace. He wants you just to be a mumbling, murmuring, complaining, grumpy kind of an individual. And that is why God in his mercy brought all of us together today to hear Psalm 100. Because here's what the writer of Psalm says. He says, first of all, that we worship God with a joyful shout. This is the way the psalm begins. Make a joyful noise. Some of your translations will say, make a joyful shout before the Lord, all ye lands. This lets me know that the excuse that I often use that I wasn't raised that way doesn't really mean a whole lot to God because God says, I want everyone. It doesn't matter if you're from rural Georgia or northern New England. It doesn't matter if you're from Indonesia or London or New Delhi or Siliguri, India. It doesn't matter if you're from the Bahamas or the Dominican Republic. 
doesn't matter if you grew up here in Palm Beach County. This is an invitation for all of the world to respond to God's plan of redemption and to respond to him and to make a joyful shout to the Lord. In, in the Hebrew, the word conveys this idea of this servant making a bold declaration that he belongs to his master. It would be as if a diplomat from America went to foreign soil and then came back to the president with good news. This, this is the message that the writer of Psalms 100 is wanting to convey. He's wanting the whole world, which means you and me, to respond with joy to God, to respond with a disposition of joy to God, to respond with a disposition of joy toward God's grace and his mercy and his kindness. He wants you to respond joyfully and he wants you to shout it out. Now I know that some people have a problem with shouting. I understand that. Uh, sometimes we get a little too pious, do we not? And we think that we can't do anything like that in the presence of God. Well, according to the Bible, if we hold to that kind of a presupposition, we're wrong. Because the Bible says, make a joyful shout, make a joyful noise before the Lord, all ye lands. In other words, it's for everybody in the whole world to receive God's grace and mercy and to reciprocate that by shouting and making a bold declaration that we belong to God. I find this intriguing because it reminds us that God is truly a global God. There is no room in the body of Christ for racism. There is no room in the body of Christ for favoritism. I know that humanity in our brokenness and humanity in our sin, we have a propensity to start having prejudices in our heart and life. And this word tells us that the church ought to be a church of global acquirement. In other words, in the body of Christ, there should be not only diversity in age, there should be diversity in ethnicity. There is no such thing as a white church or a black church or a Latino church or a Hispanic church, even though we know that within certain ethnic groups, these people gather together and worship. But this text tells us that no matter who we are, we are to declare with a shout that we belong to God. And I want to suggest something to you. If you're listening, say amen. amen. In your own spiritual warfare and in your own spiritual battle, I would suggest to you that Psalm 100 be a part of your weaponry where you come into the presence of God and you shout and you declare that you belong to God. Even though God already knows who you are, making this shout of affirmation is a key step in spiritual battle because you are reminding yourself that you are not possessed by the devil, that you are not owned by the devil, that the devil cannot overcome you. Oh, he's going to fight you. He's going to, he's going to oppress you, but he cannot overcome you because you are a child of the living God. And worship God with a joyful shout. Worship him with a joyful noise. Worship him and come into his presence. And then the text says this. Now we're just looking at the Bible this morning. But then again, isn't that we sh what we should do every Sunday? <laughs> Listen to the Bible. This is not about me. It's not about you. You know, it's funny to me that when people come to church, oftentimes they begin to critique everything but themselves. Well, I'm not going to go to that church because, you know, the preaching is a bit too long. Or I'm not going to go to that church because the singing isn't just something that moves me. And yet we never, ever critique ourselves. If you have to come to church to be turned on for Jesus, something may be awry in your life through the week. And this is what I've learned. We worship Jesus, and when we gather together, it is nothing more than an outflow of our time with God. And the text says something else. Not only that we worship him with a joyful shout, but we worship him with joyful service. Notice what the text says. Serve the Lord with gladness. That lets me know that anyone can come to church and sit in a pew for 60 minutes or 90 minutes. 
And by the way, we should come to church, right? I hope by now I don't need to unpack this biblically, but just so that we can all be reminded, church attendance is a requirement for those of us who want to follow Jesus. It's a requirement. Jesus said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as some do, but come together even more, as we know we're living in the last day, and we need to admonish one another, and we need to encourage one another. But even so, church attendance in and of itself is not the whole picture when it comes to worshiping God. Whoever wrote this psalm, I am convinced, was anointed by the Holy Spirit. I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. I believe in the infallibility of the Bible. And God was using this man to write these words to speak to us. And here's what the text says. Not only do we come before him with a shout, but we come before him and we serve him. That word serve gives the indication that we are to be people who honor God in every sphere of our life. We are to commit our total being to the Lord. For those of you who are going to college, take that experience as a college student and see it as an opportunity to serve the Lord. Go to class, study hard, be a good steward of the time that you're learning all of this knowledge and all of this understanding. Here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We are told that Paul said to these Christians in Rome, he said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Some translations put it this way, which is your reasonable act of service. In other words, there should not be this dichotomy, this bifurcation between, well, let's get serious with God on Sunday, but after all, I can't really serve him as I run my business. I can't really serve him as I'm caring for my grandchildren. After all, it's sacred on Sunday, but the rest of the week, well, that's secular and that's up to me. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that we worship him by serving him with every fiber of our being. Remember, we're just unpacking this morning how we are to worship Jesus. And the text tells us something else. The text tells us not only do we worship him with a shout, and not only do we worship him with service, but the text says that we worship him with a joyful song. That's what the Bible says. In fact, it says this, enter into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Come into his presence with singing. Now that tells me two things, brothers and sisters. Number one, it is a privilege to be in the presence of God. And number two, God in his mercy and kindness and love has made provision for us to experience the privilege of entering into his presence. And we take this too lightly, I am afraid to say. I take it too lightly, I am afraid to say. That we have an invitation to come into the presence of Almighty God who is holy, who is just, who is altogether separate, from created order, and yet he condescends himself to make, us know, make himself known, not only in the incarnation of Jesus, but he condescends himself even to make us, himself known through his word. And on the cross, it's a mystery to me. I don't fully understand it, but on the cross, somehow, God's righteousness, his justice, his mercy, and his love were all perfectly satisfied. And because of the cross, sinful man can have a relationship with a holy God. If you've ever read the Old Testament, surely you've got to have picked up on these two themes. Number one, that God delights being with his people. And number two, that you only come into God's presence on his terms. And in the Old Testament, he had Moses build the tabernacle. The tabernacle was this transient, portable presence of God. 
that he would demonstrate to his people, I want you to be in my presence, but you're going to come on my terms. Read about it. There was the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. Eventually, David wanted to build a temple. God said, you're not going to do it, but your son Solomon's going to build the temple. You know that that was destroyed in 70 AD. And Jesus, when he died, one of the last prayers out of his mouth was this, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He committed his presence, his spirit to God, and the veil in the temple was rent, not from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom, indicating that God himself has made a way for mankind to be in his presence. And we seldom think about that it took the death of a perfect Messiah. He was the sinless, spotless Son of God. God moved into our neighborhood when He took on the form of flesh and became a man. Jesus Christ, when He stepped out of the throne room of God, God the Son took on flesh. He momentarily laid aside His glory, but He did not divest Himself of any of His godly authority. He became man. And he took humanity into heaven when he died. Jesus Christ, when he became a man, will now forever be a man, even as he is at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for sinful humanity. He is God and he is man. And he's made a way for us to come in to the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, listen to the word of God. The Bible says that we have the privileged access through the provision of Jesus to come into the presence of God. And when we come into his presence, the Bible says that we are to come into his presence with singing. That's what the text says. In the New Testament, being filled with the Spirit is not just about speaking in tongues. Being filled with the Spirit, in part, is about being filled with a song. Paul said that we ought to continually be singing songs to the Lord. I say what I'm about to say with a great deal of trepidation. I've been here for over a decade, and most of you know me, and you know that I would never intentionally uh, get self-righteous in the pulpit or give anybody a spiritual spanking. If you, if you know that, say, I know, Pastor. That didn't convince me. I can't say this and so say, I know, I know. You know, when, when we talk to people about coming to our church, people will say one of the reasons they come is because they love the worship ministry. We have, I believe, the best of the best under Dr. Brian Wilson and our worship team. Yet when they open up on Sunday morning, there's only about two or three people in the church. I just want to, I want to encourage you this morning. And I say this, please know, please know that I'm not trying to fuss at you. I'm encouraging you to come here with a song in your heart and to sing to Jesus. To get to church for the purpose of singing to Jesus. Did you know that pleases the Lord? Did you know that the Lord blesses that? Did you know that he inhabits the praises of his people? Can we give God an ovation of praise right now? He's gracious and he's merciful. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 15, here's what the writer says. Through him, Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips acknowledging his name. When you leave here today, you're going to be equipped with how to worship because the text tells us that we worship with a joyful shout and that we worship with joyful service and that we worship with joyful singing. But then it says this, we worship with a joyful statement. The writer of Psalm, even though he didn't know anything about Charles Darwin, he didn't know that on November the 24th, 1859, Charles Darwin was going to release his groundbreaking humanistic, secularistic, philosophical book known as The Origin of Species. And he didn't know that that book was going to gain such a traction and create such a momentum in society that today 
evolution is taught as a fact and creation is taught as a theory. I mean, we've gotten this backwards. And the psalmist had no idea that secularism and humanism and the enlightenment would so shape and transform our society. He was just riding under the unction and the inspiration of the Spirit. But he gives us an anthropological statement. I know that's a fancy word, but that basically means the study of mankind. And the Bible has a lot to say about the origin of mankind. In fact, here's what the text says. Know that the Lord, know it. The Hebrew word is not just some passive mental assent. Know, the text says, know that he is God. It is he that hath made us. Some translations say, and not we ourselves. Probably the better translation would be, it is he that hath made us, and we need to know him. Satan doesn't want you to know him. Satan wants you to embrace secularism. He wants you to embrace humanism. He wants you to think so much of yourself that you would walk around thinking that you are a self-made man or a self-made woman. You know, we're living today, sociologists tell us that we are living in what is known as an expressive individualistic society where people don't want any kind of authority. There's a breakdown in the family today that is occurring at an epic proportion. And the church is just sitting back, not saying or doing a whole lot about it. Well, the Bible says that we've been made by God. And if that is true, then what we need to do is submit ourselves to God. And we need to submit ourselves to his word. And we need to trust that he's right and that we are the ones who are wrong. Know that the Lord, he is God. That's what the psalmist says in this text. He is God, verse 3. It is he who has made us. We are his. We are his people. And we are the sheep of his pasture. I find it interesting that if we can somehow get past the first 10 words of Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and uh, the earth and the heavens. If we can get past that, we can accept everything else the Bible has to say. There's a big debate going on right now in theology and in science and in secularism on what does the book of Genesis mean? Well, it means literally what it says. It means literally, I believe, that the world was created in seven 24-hour periods of time. I don't believe in an old earth. I believe in a relatively young earth. The Bible says that God created everything, that he created man out of the dust of the field, that he breathed life into our nostrils. I believe what Paul says, that in him we move and we exist and we have our being. I believe the Bible says that it is by him and through him and unto him that all things exist. And the writer of Psalms says this, know that he is God and he's made us. That begs the question, why is it that so many people in the modern church want to redefine those precious institutions that God has made? The institution of marriage the institution of sexuality. Well, in our brokenness, we don't want anybody ruling over us. In our brokenness, we don't want anybody telling us what to do. The psalmist simply says, no. I hope you know this morning. I hope you know that God made you. I hope you know that he loves you. I hope you know that he wants to redeem you. I hope you know that he sent Christ to the cross. He set him forth to be the covering for your sin and that through faith and repentance, he will adopt you into his family. I hope you know that. And I hope you know that he desires you to worship him, not because he's lacking in self-esteem or self-worth or needs you to build him up, but God understands that we're only completely made whole when we align ourselves with him and we recognize that he is our beginning and our end and all of our in-between. So that begs the question, why do we worship? We know how, but why? I don't have to make this up. You don't have to go read a book on worship, even though there's a lot of good ones out there. 
And I hope Dr. Wilson writes one one day. He has a lot to make in terms of contributing to these fields of study. But this text tells us why we worship. It spells it out. First of all, we worship because God is good. That's what the Bible says. Life is not good. Cancer is not good. Divorce is not good. Pregnancy out of wedlock is not good. All of these things that this fallen world embraces and all that we experience in a broken world is not good. Well, the writer never said that. The writer didn't say that war was good, that murder was good, that adultery was good, that infanticide or genocide was good. He simply said that God is good. And that's why we worship him. This is time for you and I to grow up. It's time for us to embrace Well, what the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 1, desire the sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby. We worship not because God answers all of our prayers. We worship because God is good. He's good. He's good in his plans. He's good in his power. He's good in his provision. He's good in his sovereignty. He's good in his redemption. He's good because God is good. It's part of who he is. Satan wants you to create a caricature of God based on your own worldly wisdom. And he wants you to define God and understand God without understanding how God has revealed himself in the Bible. And that's why we create gods like I Dream a Genie, where God just exists to make me happy, that he exists to be a chummy mate or a friend. No, God reveals himself, and in all of his ways, even in his judgment, we know that he's good. You remember what Jesus said in John 10? He said, I am the good shepherd. This text says not only that God made us, but that he's also our shepherd. We need a good shepherd, do we not? This is intriguing to me. When you study about agriculture, and we don't know much about this in North America, sheep are the dumbest of all animals. They're always getting themselves in trouble. They're always meandering and they're always wondering and they're always getting into some kind of a typical circumstance where they're needing to be rescued. And God constantly rescues us, doesn't he? Can I get a witness this morning? He's always rescuing us. And some of you this morning, you need to be rescued. You need to be delivered. Turn to the good shepherd because he's good. And worship him. Why do you sing to him? Why do you come to church? You come because God is good. You sing because God is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Some of you don't know that because you've yet to taste and see that the Lord is good. What does James say in chapter one? He says this, that everything that comes from God is good and perfect. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow to change. God is always good. He never changes and he's merciful. The text says that he is merciful in all of his ways. What does that mean? The word hesed in the Hebrew is the word, the word uh, mercy in Hebrew is the word hesed. And it can be translated as, as mercy. It can be translated as uh, unfailing love. It can be translated as steadfast faithfulness. Here's what I know. This text says that we worship God because of his mercy. Where were you when God showed you you needed mercy? Trust me on this. From a biblical perspective, you did not figure it out on your own. We're predisposed to sin, to go away from God, to run as fast as we can and to rebel against him and all forms of authority. Our disposition is to sin. Our disposition is to run away from God. Our disposition is to get involved in everything that God says don't do. But God in his mercy turns us around and he lets us see our sin and he lets us see his mercy in saving us through Christ. We worship God today because he's merciful. 
for those of us who are dealing with family, children, spouses, loved ones, co-workers, who seem to just be running headlong into sin and disobedience. Let's just pray that God would somehow reveal his mercy to them, his mercy in the midst of judgment, his mercy in the midst of sin. But for those of us who've experienced it, this is why. And we worship him not only because of his goodness and not only because of his mercy, but we worship him because he is continually faithful. He will never drop the ball. He will never let us down. He will never fail us. Pastors fail people. Church people fail people. Parents fail their children. Children fail their parents. Best friends fail one another. God will never fail. He cannot. It is contrary to who he is as a person. It's not part of his nature. It's not part of his attributes. God is perfect in all of his ways. He's good. He's merciful. And he is faithful. Can we give God this morning an ovation of praise for his grace and his goodness? So when you don't feel like worshiping, how are you going to do it? You're going to shout. You're going to sing. You're going to devote your life and say, I'm going to do this for the glory of God. In fact, today, go home and write out a worship song between you and Jesus and sing it continually. Bring it into his presence. Why do you do that? Because he's good, he's merciful, and he's always going to be faithful to you. Today, as we prepare for communion, I'm going to ask those who are going to serve communion to very quickly please make your way forward. And I'm going to ask you to quickly prepare yourself as you prepare to serve this congregation communion this morning. Thank you.
If you're able to stand, would you please stand at this time? In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he um, said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This morning, as we eat, we're simply remembering that Jesus' body was broken, that we may be whole. Let's eat together. And then in the same way, he took the cup, and after supper said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He died, he was buried, he raised on the third day, he ascended into heaven, he's at the right hand of the Father interceding for you, and he's coming again. God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. 